All right. So today we are going to talk about um, general anesthetic, right? Even more. And uh, today for the inhalants, okay, the anesthetic inhalants, we are going to talk about the basics, how they work, what are the some physiological rules that are being followed, what are the, some biological aspects that we have to take care of, right? Uh, when we are administering a general anesthetic, right? So let's get started. And today after, uh, uh, in, the, in the fourth lecture, like including this one, okay? This is the first one, then one, two, three, four. In the fourth lecture, I would ask you all to unmute yourself. And then I would ask you that what exactly made this Sleeping Beauty sleep so long, okay? And what exactly woke it up? I was very happy yesterday when Rabia uh, posted in the comment section that it was flumazenil and she actually explained it, that it was, uh, uh, what was exactly the mechanism of action and everything. She tried to reason her answer. Similarly, I would expect from all of you to do that, right? I, I am looking forward uh, for participation, right? And uh, maybe I'll mark it even, right? So you, your, um, your participation is observed and it is uh, highlighted in other ways also, right? Okay, so starting up. We have seen the general classification already, right? That when we have, uh, whenever we take general anesthetics, so we do have two major classification that is inhale and IV. In, 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 in the inhalation, right? We have the gaseous anesthetics, we have volatile. We have uh, in IV, we have barbiturates, dissociative, and uh, the other, other ones. And then we have opioids, and then we have benzodiazepine. The other kind of classification we have seen is uh, that in IV, uh, the drugs are even further categorized by their um, action uh, by, by the duration of action, right? Uh, so it is like either in fast inducing drugs or the slow acting drugs, right? I've already talked about it, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Well, what is the purpose of general anesthetic? Once again, we should remind ourselves the purpose of general anesthetic is that we want our brain to go into uh, depressive mode, right? Uh, we, we don't want it to be excited at all, right? And we want this uh, entire mechanism to be reversible, right? We want uh, to be back again, working the way we work, all right? Once the surgical operation is over. So we don't want an extended side effects or adverse effects or any other thing, right? So the major purpose of general anesthetic is induction of reversible loss of pain sensation by depressing CNS, right? Okay, so you see guys, whenever um, the uh, anest uh, from anesthesia, wait a minute, when they, uh, uh, first of all, let's say we give IV anesthesia, right? And then we try to maintain it through the inhalation, right? So this inhalation anesthetics are actually the anesthetics that are used in order to maintain okay, um, the amount of drug within the blood, right? Uh, that is reaching the blood, okay? Then is the major advantage is that depth of anesthesia can be rapidly altered by changing the inhale uh, concentration of the drug. So very quickly, you can produce effect by increasing or decreasing the uh, dose, okay? The next thing is that these have very narrow therapeutic index. So you need to be careful whenever you're administering the anesthetics, right? Um, no antagonist exists. So you have to be again, extremely careful, okay? Then is in order to minimize waste. Uh, now read this line very carefully and then we, we are going to talk more about it, okay? All right, so in order to minimize uh, waste and decrease cost, 
potent inhaled anesthetic agents are delivered in a recirculation system containing absorbents that remove carbon dioxide and allow rebreathing of the inhaled anesthetic. I'm sure you must have heard uh, this particular thing for the first time that uh, whenever somebody is anesthetized, so you see a soda line cylinder is actually attached in the machine, right? And why exactly soda lime is attached? Uh, because we want carbon dioxide to be absorbed, okay? Now, you must be thinking, just imagine, guys, just imagine that I am saying that I am providing inhalation, okay? And then the gas that is coming out, okay? I am, I am passing it through uh, this tank, okay? So that the carbon dioxide will be removed from here. Now, you must be thinking why, why exactly, right? And the reason is that there is a terminology that is carbon dioxide retention or carbon dioxide poisoning. We don't want that to happen, right? Because of which we are, we have attached the cylinder of soda lime in the machine, okay? And because of this thing, what will happen is that the, uh, the, the exhaled air will be deprived of carbon dioxide. So now when the anesthetic drug, drugged air would reach into the alveoli, carbon dioxide gradient would be there, okay? And because of the gradient, carbon dioxide would be removed from the blood. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. What do I mean by gradient and all? If you don't understand, you can always ask me and I can uh, explain to you uh, in this, either in this lecture or keep a se separate lecture for this one, okay? All right. So common features of inhalation anesthetics is that it is non-flammable, it is non-explosive, has have increased perfusion. Now, what is perfusion? Perfusion is that how much of the drug is entering into the blood. That is perfusion, okay? So why exactly is this half increased perfusion? You see, guys, uh, I'm sure you must have studied about this already in your uh, junior classes or in your high school that let's say if this is alveoli, all right? So on top of it, we do have a meshwork of capillaries, right? We do have the, wait a minute, let me draw it very quickly. I won't take much time. Wait a minute. All right. So the thing is that let's say this is alveoli and this is lined up by the meshwork of capillaries. All right. Now what will happen is that the deoxygenated blood is coming, all right, into the, um, uh, the deoxygenated blood is coming. Uh, and now the carbon dioxide would actually diffuse into the alveoli. All right. Now just imagine when the body is at rest, right? Uh, carbon dioxide it, uh, is obviously produced in a, a, an extremely low amount, right? And when carbon dioxide is produced in an extremely low amount, then what will happen? Uh, we want to have a gradient, right? Um, how much carbon dioxide is present in air already? Only 0 0.03 to 0.04% of the uh, uh, carbon dioxide is present in air, right? So just imagine with that less concentration, right? We want carbon dioxide to be removed. We want gradient to be there, right? So that is why what we'll do is this, that in order to keep the gradient, we will, uh, and we want to remove the carbon dioxide, that is why. And now when carbon dioxide is removed, so the, so the blood that is coming here, right? More of the drug is being diffused into the capillaries. It's okay, Ravi, no issues, but if, all right. So I hope I'm clear to you, what do I mean by increased perfusion here, okay? Now is uh, bronchodilation, all right. Before talking about this point, okay, I want you to understand basics of uh, some terminologies, okay? Because if you don't know these terminologies, so guys, just give me one minute. All right. 
Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that before we start talking more about the topic, okay, it is very much important that you should know about these important uh, terminologies, okay? If you see here, this wave, okay, uh, the wave that is going up and down, okay, this is the tidal volume, okay? This is the volume of air that we usually breathe in and out, okay? And now, uh, over here, you see this much is the inspiratory capacity, okay? So this is the volume of maximum air you can breathe in, okay? And the expiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of air that you can exhale out, all right? What is important for you to know is that there is also a certain amount of air that is there in your lungs, all right, which stays there, all right? Um, and that is called residual volume, all right? And this volume is there always in the air. It is important uh, to keep the lungs inflated, all right? Uh, otherwise, it would collapse, right? All right. Then the other important terminology that you should know is hypoxic pulmonary constriction. Because uh, in, in, when I'll go back to the slide, then you'll get to know that we will, I would use this terminology in one line, all right? And if you don't know this terminology, you would not understand what I'm talking about, okay? So what happens is, let's say that uh, obviously everybody has like two lungs, right? Let's say your uh, left hand, left lung, right? It is working perfectly, okay? It is rich with oxygen and it is oxygenated blood and everything, right? However, your right lung, right? It has something um, stuck within the bronchioles, okay? And it did not let any of the air enter into the lungs, okay? So what would happen is, that your one of the lungs would get deprived of oxygen, right? When it would get deprived of oxygen, uh, so obviously the blood capillaries will send the message to the brain that, okay, we are not getting enough oxygen from this part of your body, okay? So in response, what blood would do, what, what brain would do is that it would constrict the capillary, okay? It would constrict the uh, Wait a minute, it would constrict the capillary, okay? So what would happen because of that? So that is called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, okay? So what is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? That this is a vasoconstriction in the lungs, okay? Which is caused due to hypoxia. I hope I'm clear to you. Now let's get back to the slide. So what exactly this inhalation uh, and aesthetic they're doing is they're increasing the bronchodilation, okay, they're causing bronchodilation and they're decreasing two things. They're decreasing spontaneous minute ventilation and hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, you know what is that, right? It is vasoconstriction. So when the resistance would be decreased, so obviously more and more oxygen would be provided, right? And furthermore, uh, when we are talking about spontaneous minute ventilation, now what is that? Guys, um, imagine that in a minute, okay, the amount of air that you're breathing in and you're breathing out, okay? So in total, that volume of air is the uh, amount of air that you're breathing per minute, okay? And in scientific languages, it's called a spontaneous minute ventilation. I hope I'm clear to you what I'm saying, okay? So what it's doing is, that it is decreasing the breath per minute, okay? And it is decreasing the vasoconstriction that was caused due to hypoxia, okay? Clear everybody? All right. Now then is the movement of these agents from lungs to different parts of the body compartments depends upon their solubility in blood and tissue as well as on blood flow. Uh, and I'm sure you know already know about breath, right? We have talked in deep detail last last year about it. All right, potency. I'm sure you all know what is that. Right now, I'm not teaching you definition of potency. Right now, I'm teaching you uh, how to gauge either the anesthetic is potent or not, right? Okay, so 
when I am saying an anesthetic is potent, okay, so I'm going to use the terminology MAC, that is minimum alveolar, uh, alveolar concentration, okay? Guys, think about it. If I'm saying the drug is potent, okay, so what do you think? More quantities needed or less quantities needed in order to put the person into um, the uh, anesthetized state? Yes, guys, I want your response in the chat box. What do you guess? I'm repeating my question, okay? I'm saying that if I'm saying a drug is potent, okay? So what do you think? Would the consideration more be needed or less be needed of that particular drug? It's already written on the slide, come on guys. Oh yeah, good Rabia. I, I think only Rabia is going to pass the exam, huh? Okay, Tanzila also saying less needed. Okay, good, good, good. Good, 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 Marwa. Very good, very nice. Now everybody is, you know. <laughs> all right, all right, great. Great, Sana. All right. Okay, guys. So I've already said it and it is already mentioned on the slide as well, right? That um, if a drug is more potent, right? So you need less quantity of it, okay? And if a drug is less potent, so you need larger quantity of it, right? Okay. Um, so the drug that is more potent, okay? And how do we gauge that a drug is more potent or less potent? We see whenever we administer uh, inhalant anesthetic to a patient, okay? We see that in 50% of the population, how much of the dose was required in order to uh, inhibit movements in that specific uh, group, okay? So that a surgical uh, procedure can be done on those patients, okay? You can see that a skin incision, I have written in the bracket, right? So how much of the dosage was needed that if the skin would be um, uh, cut it out, okay? So uh, like, uh, so an incision not cut out, the incision, if the incision is made, okay? So uh, a, a patient won't feel any pain, okay? So if we gauge it by keeping in view 50% of the population, okay? All right. Uh, so the more lipid soluble and an anesthetic, the lower the concentration of anesthetic needed to produce anesthesia and thus the higher potency of anesthetic, anesthetic. And I'm sure you all know the reason already, right? All right. So guys, you see here, um, this is the uh, entire, uh, I've, I've taken this, I'm sure you must have recognized already. This is a graph from Lippin Cot, right? And this is about percentage anesthetic drugs that how much of the percent is needed in order to produce the MAC, okay? All right. So factors that increase MAC. When we are increasing MAC, it means what? Yes, Vita. What do I mean by that if I'm saying if I'm saying that, um, okay, yeah. So what do I mean by that? That the drugs that are increasing MAC, what do you understand by this terminology? Can you send me in the chat box? Tell me, what do you understand about it? I'm repeating my question. I'm saying that we are talking about conditions that would um, increase MAC, okay? So what do we mean by that? I'm waiting for your answers. All 
All right. So we were talking about this, that what are the factors that would increase MAC? It means that increase the concentration required to produce anesthetic condition, right? So that is hyperthermia and drugs that increase CNS catecholamines and chronic ethanol abuse, okay? So these are the drugs that would require more concentration in order to produce effect. That is why you see uh, doctors do not provide any procedure when you're, uh, you have fever, okay? That is why a medical operation does not happen if, you're, uh, if your body temperature is high. First of all, the body temperature is de decreased and then the procedure happens, okay? Factors that decrease MAC, okay? So they would be increased age, hypothermia, pregnancy, sepsis, acute ethanol intoxication, concurrent administration of IV anesthetics, alpha, ad, alpha 2 adrenergic receptor agonists, for example, uh, clonidine and dex medo, um, midi uh, tomid, tomidine, okay? All right, so now we'll talk about the uptake and distribution of inhalation uh, anesthetics, okay? So the goal is basically to produce equilibrium. Equilibrium in what? that the amount of drug that is present in the alveoli, the equal amount of drugs should be present in the brain and the equal amount of drugs should be present in the, uh, you know, uh, in the blood, okay? So that, okay, so that uh, you see the equal distribution is there, all right? So at, uh, at uh, equilibrium, you want alveolar blood partial pressure, arterial partial pressure, and brain partial pressure to be equal, right? And if it's not equal, so obviously anesthesia won't uh, produce the effect. I'm sure you must understand now that the initial uh, diffusion of anesthetics is also due to concentration gradient, right? Okay, now we'll talk about alveolar wash-in, right? So this term refers to the replacement of the normal lung gases with inspired uh, anesthetic mixture, right? So you want, as I said, that equal amount of uh, anesthetic drugs should be in equal quantity in the compa different compartments of the body, okay? So uh, this is the alveolar wash-in, okay, guys? Remember the terminology, okay? All right, so the time required for this process is directly proportional to the functional residual capacity of the lung. That is the air that is in the uh, lungs uh, in order to keep it inflated and intact, okay? And inversely proportional to the ventilatory rate. It is independent of the physical properties of the gas. As a partial pressure builds within the lung, anesthetic transfer of from the lungs begin. So what is anesthetic uptake? Anesthetic uptake is a product of gas solubility, cardiac output, and anesthetic gradient, okay? So you can say that if any of these is increasing, okay, if the gradient is increasing, if cardiac output is increasing, if uh, gas solubility is increasing, so similarly, the anesthetic uptake would be increased, and as a result, what will happen? Uh, more and more drug would be diffused and more uh, fast and much better effect would be produced, okay? Guys, we have already talked about solubility in the blood, right? So I'm not going to talk more about it, okay? Uh, however, let's discuss these two specific examples. That is anesthetics gas with low blood solubility, such as nitrous oxide. Guys, this nitrous oxide is also called, by the way, laughing gas, okay? So, um, <laughs> All right, so this laughing gas diffuses from the alveoli into the circulation. Little of the anesthetic dissolves in the blood. Therefore, the equilibrium between the inhaled anesthetic and arterial blood occurs rapidly and relatively few additional molecules of anesthetic are required to raise arterial anesthetic partial pressure, thereby rapidly achieving a steady state. Agents with low solubility in blood quickly saturate in the blood, okay? Uh, thus, they saturate, okay. Now, anesthetic gas with high solubility, okay, such as halothane. 
halo is from the halogenation okay the halogenated gases okay so this dissolves more completely in the blood so the greater amounts of anesthetics are there for longer periods okay so this results in increased time of induction and recovery and slower changes in the depth of anesthesia in response to alteration in the concentration of the inhaled drug right all right so when we talk about cardiac output so cardiac output is all about that um, uh, it affects the removal of anesthetic to peripheral tissue which are not the site of action for inhaled anesthetics higher cardiac output means slower induction right so just imagine the blood is moving fast in one of the veins okay and the other vein blood is moving slowly right so if the cardiac output is high right so obviously the induction would be slow i hope you're getting okay so a low cardiac output that is shock speeds the rate of rise of alveolar concentration of the gas since there is less uptake okay guys just two three minutes left in presentation okay alveolar to venous partial pressure gradient of the anesthetic this is the driving force of anesthetic delivery and obviously because of that the diffusion happens okay all right so okay please ignore that okay this is like one word okay so effect of different tissue types of uh, on anesthetic uptake so the time required for par particular tissue to achieve a steady state with the partial pressure of an anesthetic gas in the inspired mixture is inversely proportional to the blood flow to that tissue so the fast flow results in more rapid blood flow as we have already discussed okay and obviously again the role of diffusion and gradient plays a huge role so main the four major tissue compartments are the first one is brain heart liver kidney and endocrine glands so these highly perfused tissues rapidly attain a steady state with the partial pressure of anesthetic in the blood the skeletal muscles these are poorly perfused okay so this uh, this and the fact that uh, they have large volume prolongs the time required to achieve a steady state uh, fat this tissue is also poorly perfused however potent volatile general anesthetics are very lipid soluble therefore fat has a large capacity to store anesthetic okay then we have bone ligament and cartilage so these are poorly perfused and you know the entire thing okay by now washout means that how much period would be taken to remove the drug right so uh, okay so you see nitrous oxide exists the body faster than halothane and you can relate all of the other things to it right okay all right guys thank you so much